I greet us all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Buana Sifiwe. You look good from uh, up here, and it's a joy to see us this uh, wonderful, sunny, cold morning. And my name is Peter Parisimiti, and uh, I am married to one Nancy. I serve with the Fellowship of Christian Unions, FOCUS. Uh, famously known as Focus Kenya, a body that works to reach out to young people in the universities and colleges. I am very grateful, Reverend Ibrahim, together with the leadership of the church, for considering me to share with us uh, the word this morning on the subject, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we're just going to have part one of it because we all know that there are those virtues have many, isn't it? And for us to cover in one Sunday, we may not be able to, to, to accomplish so much. So thank you so much. Allow me to read Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, all the way to verse 25. Galatians chapter 5, sorry, verse 16, all the way to verse 25. The scripture is, is up there. And this is what the word of God says. So I say... Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, also known as sensual acts, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Like this is referring to those uh, acts of flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Bonus if you are son. And that's the word of God this morning that we are going to derive lessons and we are going to uh, eat from it in quotes as we are journeying together through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Some key things that the text just brings about. No, so I say live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. In other words, you will not please the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. In other words, flesh and the Spirit are always at war. Your desire to sin is always fighting every day with the desire to pursue holiness. Isn't it? It keeps every day you, it's like a tug of war. And as we, as we, as we do just the introduction, this someone comes, the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes as a continuation of the teachings about the Holy Spirit that we've had for the last, um, I think, few weeks before last Sunday when we had Bishop Orengo who came to speak to us. And, and we have just been looking at the Holy Spirit as a means of radiating God's glory. Bonus, if you will. And just it's, as we gear towards the end of, the, of that subject of the Holy Spirit, just thought, we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, it comes as a continuation whereby we were able to learn that the Holy Spirit is God equally in nature and in person. It is not a force whereby we may refer to it. He is not a force. You know, and we live in a time where we have put 
the Holy Spirit to understand that for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you must show two signs. And I think they are very popular nowadays. You must speak in tongues or have a gift of prophecy. And sadly, we have used that to equate to spiritual maturity. Is that so? Is that so? I mean, we have taken that to equate that and even forgotten about what the Holy Spirit is, who is equally God. He is part of the Godhead. He was there at the beginning in creation. When you journey through Genesis 1, all the way to Revelation, you will be able to see a touch of God in the concept of the Trinity. And you know, Jesus himself, even before he departed, he promised us one thing, that you will give you, I will give you, my father will give you a wonderful counselor and a helper for that matter, who is to dwell in us as believers. Therefore, the Holy Spirit was to come to help us, to reveal to us the mysteries of God himself, according to John, one as if you were sana, to tell us who God is. And I know even Reverend Ibrahim has appreciated the spiritual gifts which are a means to manifest the Holy Spirit. But today also I would like to add another thing which is in biblically, that there is also a means in which we are able to see whether you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. I know we can live in a time where we try to understand how do I know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have the spiritual gifts that are enshrined in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit? Leave alone the manifestation about rolling down. You know, that is okay. You know, I don't say that God cannot come to us in that. He may, he can. Because after all, his word is like a hammer. Isn't it? He's able to come to us in his own way that he wants and he's able to break our hearts. And the Holy Spirit comes as a divine enabler to pursue righteousness and godliness. Jesus came as the Son and God among us. But I dare say the Holy Spirit is the God who is in us to those who believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the God in, in us. You know, as long as you are born again and you have, con and you have been redeemed of the Lord, you have God in you in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I want to show us just in a nutshell what man is without the Holy Spirit. Man without God. You know, this is what man is without God according to Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. You know, we will never produce that seed of righteousness or godliness. This is all that we keep doing. And I alluded earlier on that Spirit, the spirit and the flesh keep fighting. The acts of the flesh are obvious. You know, when you think about sexual immorality, impurity, lustful desires, jealousy, anger, impatience, I dare say, <laughs> I've added mine there, and other sins like this, selfish ambition, outburst of anger, you know, division, envy, Hostility, quarreling, you know, all those things don't ever be deceived, my dear brethren. They don't come from God. You know the way you say, I am always very easily irritated. That one does not justify God in you. You know the way one grows in jealousy. You look at, hey, I think I like, I think I look at that so and so and I don't like the way they are doing the things and their blah, blah, blah. And the cut of jealousy is in you. That is a spirit of, that is a spirit of the world. It is not the spirit of God. And therefore, those can be categorized as many as possible as sin. And you know, as long as one continuously lives in flesh, they will always produce sin. Are we together? As long as one continues to live in flesh, they will always do what? Produce what? See, I'm not saying that we die and then we kill ourselves. Not, not really, that is not the case. 
But as long as we continuously live under the control of flesh, we will continuously produce sin. Now I say that man that is not under the influence of God himself daily exalts self and distort godliness. Every day, man that is not under the influence of God, they exalt self and distort godliness. So then we ask ourselves, so what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? You know, even before we talk about that, I come from a community that keeps cows and goats. That church will tell you where I come from. And there's no day I have ever woken up and seen a cow give birth to a goat. And, and I know even for us, there's no single day that has ever happened. And as we talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you have not heard me say the fruits. I've just said the fruit. Why the fruit? Because when the Holy Spirit is in us, He's able to produce those virtues as a package. There is no day that you say, I, today I will love, tomorrow I will be patient. There is no day that you will say, let me work on kindness today. Next week I will work on humility. When the Holy Spirit of God is in us, we will be able to see all those virtues. And you remember even the, the scripture says in verse 23, again as such things, meaning that there are many more. You can't be having one and be lacking in another. And I know this, someone might not be so excited. I know, but let us just dig in the word of God. And I hope that he's going to give us hope this morning. Because one thing, these things that we are talking about, we will not produce by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit in us. And so that is the hope that we have. The fact that we have God in us, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that is able to help us produce such. And fruit can be defined as a person outward actions that results from the condition of the heart. A person's outward actions that results from the condition of the heart. The way I live, the things I do, say much more about my heart than the physical thing that you see in me. I may be dressed in a good suit. I may be speaking in the language of, that you all of you can't, can't even be able to understand. But do you know what? You can never deny godliness in you. It can't ever hide itself. The action, the things that you keep, that I keep doing on a daily basis, they show much more the condition of, the, my, of my heart than the physical things that we keep uh, doing. As I told you, I work with young people in the universities. And one of the things that we usually teach them is about ordering your, their private world in terms of making sure that their inner man is fed and the likes and they do things here and there. And there's this quote that we keep telling them. That who you are in public, who you are in public can never deny who you are in private. The person that you are is exactly the same person. The same man that you're feeding in terms of the inner man. When I see you bursting out in anger, that's what you other students. When I see you living and going with uncombed hair, when I see you walking around without tucking in your shirt that's supposed to be tucked in, when I see you walking in a way that is exactly suggesting that you are, you are confused, then I will know one thing. Your inner man is not being taken care of.
And you know, Matthew 7, 16 even tells us what the fruit is. You can identify them by their, that is by the way they do what? They act, the way you act, that is exactly the fruit that you produce. And you know, he says, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Like they're always saying, can a cow give birth to a goat? A good tree produces what? And a bad tree produces what? A bad fruit. There is no gray. There is nothing like this is gray. To me, I look confused, kidogo. Now that cannot, cannot happen. And you know, God expects all of us to produce fruits in our work of faith. You know, when you think about John 15, verse 1 to 2, what he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. That's the, down there, he brings us as the branches. And then verse 2, he says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it can be even more fruitful. And we are talking about good fruit. Fruit that will last. He cuts off every branch in that bears no fruit. And we know we are referred to as the branch in there alongside when you read up to John 15 verse 8. God expects all of us and we will be looking down there shortly. And the fruit is produced by a person living in the spirit. It is not living by flesh. The fruit is produced by a person living in the spirit. And you know when you talk about living in the spirit, it's basically just to crucify the flesh and all its passion, that sin that keeps popping up, that aspect of selfishness, jealousy, anger, sexual immorality, and forgiveness that keeps popping up. It continuously, it's a man, a man who is living by the spirit, continuously suppress that so that God may be seen in them in the name of the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation to walk in obedience with God and under constant counsel of the Holy Spirit. And I say it's even entering to war with worldly places and putting to death self. If you want to know that you have put self to death completely, find a day that you will look at a photo, a group photo that has been taken. And because you have not appeared very well, you are not, you are not going to delete that photo. You know when you look for that group photo, who do you usually look first? Self. If I'm not there, delete that photo. And even ask someone, please pull down that, fo that photo. It's just an expression that man every day keeps fighting for space for himself. Romans 8, 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will... Oh, sorry. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You know, and, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit as we describe them can actually be termed as the hallmarks of Christianity. The true definition of who a Christian is. Let me ask this. In my place of work, as a student in school, as a business person, as an employee of an organization, as a married man, husband or wife, as a child in that family, can anyone pass by and look at you and say, I have seen a believer? I know that is very personal. I know that is very personal. You know, we keep saying that, how do I know that this person is born again? How do I know that indeed I have received salvation? The hallmarks of Christianity, love, peace, joy, 
you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, also known as humility, and self-control. And let's look at a few, a few of them. We shall just look at the first four. Then uh, I know Reverend will guide us who will handle the remaining ones. The first four, the first one is love. Bishop Orengo last week mentioned, helped us appreciate, especially the love towards God. And in Greek, for those of us who have done a, a, a theology or who are acquainted with, with Greek a little bit, I am not as much. We, have, we can describe love in three forms. What we call the eros, the romantic love, the love between you and your spouse, the love between you and your fiancé, I mean, and the likes. And we are, talking about, we are not talking about same-sex love. Are we together? Talking about the romantic love, the love between you and your spouse, the love between you and your girlfriend, for those who are not married, and the likes and the likes. And then we have what we call philos, and that, that what we call the romantic one is what we call eros. Then we have the philos, which is basically the brotherly love, the love that you have towards your children, the love that you have towards your family members, the love that you have towards even the brethren, the family of, of God. And then we have the agape, which is the epitome of all, the perfect love that only who can give, only God can give. Born as if you were son. And that is so perfect, it is without error. You know, when you talk about love, I keep wondering, why did Paul brings, bring this kind of virtues to us, especially something like love? But when you look at life, and I know this one, we agree. Life is made up of love. To be loved and to, and to love. It is through love that we feel a sense of belonging, isn't it? God himself, loving man to a point of death, God himself loving you and I to a point of dying on the cross to save us. And in response, ask man to love him. Remember what um, should be Luke 10, 27 that talks about, you shall love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. But also you shall love your neighbor as you are, as yourself. God has never taught us what we call today self-love. That is an origin of man. You know the way we see pictures, love yourself because nobody loves you? Oh, no, no, sorry. This one is not here. This one is not here. But the Christian faith is actually the epitome of love. And when you talk about even loving God and loving our neighbors, because naturally man loves himself, isn't it? Naturally. You don't even struggle to love yourself. You don't. But God, I believe he knows that we struggle to love him and we struggle to love our neighbor. And actually he says this is the greatest commandment. And we don't love, and you know even he says, he's not even asking us to love others, having not himself first done that. He says, you love others because I have first done what? I have loved you. He first loved us. And this should remove in the picture something we call conditional love. You love me, I love you. You do me, I do you. You treat me nicely, I treat you nicely. Now that is not of God. That is not of God. And I will say something shortly about love. And because I know it's not easy. Isn't it? It's not easy for that matter. And I say that it is, it is not an easy affair because it is easier to love God, but not your neighbor. It is easier to love God, but not that spouse that keeps on scratching on you and keeping your bruises on. That is so, it is so easy to come here and we lift our hands and praise the Lord. That I know it is so easy for us to do that, but not our neighbor. 
And love itself, I dare say, it's the true expression of true religion. You know, even what 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 3 says, even if I have love, what? Okay, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. And this is what he says. And I think I like how it, it ends in verse 31 of chapter 12. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all, if I, give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. It is not an easy affair, but it is the true expression of our religion and our faith. First John chapter 4, verse 19 to 20, I alluded to earlier on. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister and sister whom they have seen cannot do what? Love God whom they have not seen. It is not possible. And as I'm talking about love, I'm not talking about love that, is, that you continuously live in a, in, a, in a hostile relationship or hostile marriage that you keep on facing danger for your life. No, that is not love at that point. Love. It's not for the faint-hearted, but for the courageous. Those who are willing to give even if they are not going to receive anything. And I know those who are married here can agree. The 10 months I have been in marriage, I have realized this word called I love you is not easy. It's not easy. I wish as I was saying this, my wife was here. So it doesn't appear like uh, it's a gossip. You know, every day, you have to die to self. Die literally to self. You know, I think I was telling my friends some other time, in, in, in it should be last year or early this year, that, um, why is it this escaping my mind? Um, I keep telling, I, I told them that it is not easy for one to love, especially if they have not known God. Because unless God is in me, I think the way that I will react normally will be bursting in those moments that when we have been wronged by your sister, by your brother, by your, by your wife, by your fiancé. And I keep reminding myself of one thing. Even when those moments come, either from family, from colleagues, from, from whoever, that I did not call myself, God called me. And because he called me, according to John 15 verse 16, I have to bear that fruit that is called love, even if it is and deserving to do so. Love may be expressed in marriage, in our relationships with other people and our fiancés for those who are not married, in our family. You know, it's called even to love even that relative at home in the rural area that keeps calling you, asking you for money, but they never call to ask you how you are doing. Kukiwa na mchango hivi. Do we have our son, we have our guka, we have our father who is in Eldoret. Let me call them to just send us something. You know, I have siblings at home who are in high school. And the immediate moment that they are just about to go to school, we lost our dad, so a, a bit of responsibility here and there. The immediate moment they are just about to go to school, that is when they look for your, for your number. Peter, we are just about to go to school. We need fare and pocket money. 
You know, you keep wondering, why don't they call me just to check on me? But when I remember one thing, I did not choose myself. I did not even choose to be a firstborn. I didn't even choose to be a parent to that child who is hostile. I didn't even choose to be a parent to that child who is not responsible. I didn't even choose to be born in that family that everyone, you are the only one who is working. Then you will do it. Because you didn't call yourself, he called you. Born as if you were son. You know, even our communities, loving that employee that every day you give them a work to do, they bring you a shoddy work. You supervise their work, they get angry. You told them to correct something, they do it even much more worse. That employer that keeps withholding your salary. I know it, I said at the beginning, this is not easy. This is not easy. But it is possible with God. You know that neighbor that keeps pouring water next to your doorstep? That landlord that keeps on rationing water when you're not around? Loving them the way Christ loved you. Born as if you were son. Because if God did not come to me, my brothers and sisters, I don't think I would have ever trusted him. And I know it's the same case to all of us. And sharing our faith to that friend, to that person that you're seated to next in Amatatu. If you say that I love God and I come here every Sunday morning and I lift my hands and praise the Lord and worship him. And when I leave, I know there is a neighbor there who is languishing in bang, cigarette and alcohol. And I have never mentioned to them about God. That is not love. I liked when I saw someone recently say, if you are my friend and I have never shared with you about God, forgive me. I have failed terribly. I shouldn't be your friend. You know, the body of Christ and the like. Let's move on to the second batch. Joy. Joy. And you know, we're talking about just basically finding delight in God and in our conversation with others. Joy, joy, joy. And it's a kind of happiness that even in good times or bad times, we have towards God and we have towards our friends. It's the only kind of joy that only God can give us, dare say. Because it is not easy for you to rejoice when you know very well that you have lacked supper that night. It is not easy to rejoice when you know you have lost a friend. But you know, Scripture says in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Find delight in me always. I will say it again. Find delight in me always. And you know, always is a present continuous word, isn't it? In English. It's something that we keep doing on a daily basis. It, should, it ought to be expressed on a daily basis, sorry. You know, finding delight even at the hate of injustice. You went to the court and you desired justice to be served and that has not been done. You come back home. And I'm saying this, it is not easy. You come back home and praise the Lord and say, Lord, even in this one, you are still my God. And I know you will carry me through. At the moment of discrimination or situation that will even lead you, easily you to become angry towards him. And even says in James 1.3, consider it pure joy. When you face trials, for such trials, do what? Produce perseverance. Amen. One as if you were some. Consider it pure joy. In that moment when you are facing trials and temptations and you think you are reaching the dead rock or you are at the end of it, you still find reason to be, to be delighting in God himself and even in enjoying the life 
with other people. You know, rejoicing with others, with those who rejoice, and mourning with those who mourn. That is what Romans 12, 15 says. I just talked about joy in God, but also joy even with our neighbors, our friends, and our relatives. Rejoicing at their point of success and even at their point of failure. Going there to tell them, brother and sister, it is well. It is well with God. Enjoying our relationship with others, even in those moments when they are not able even to be of good to us in anywhere. Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. It is not a, it's not a, a matter of situation. It's not a matter of circumstance. It is not a matter of whether we had it or not but it is finding joy every day with our Lord Jesus Christ and even in the situation that are around us. You know, joy that comes with provision or lack, joy that comes even in those moments, in quote, and forgive me, moments that we have mood swings. You know those good moments that you're not so good? Joy that comes even in those moments. You know, finding joy <laughs> in doing that work even when you know that you're being paid little. Is that easy? Not at all. Or even when the employer or employee is not appreciating what you are doing. Finding joy in God alone. But that leaves peace as we near the conclusion. Peace, peace, peace. The shalom of God. The calmness towards God amidst every varying situation. Instead of accepting God's divine help, regardless of the storms of life. You know, that peace that comes even in times that you can't explain the situation that you are in. The only peace that only God can give. The peace that surpasses all human understanding. The enemy has done it so well to bring something we call anxiety. In troublesome moments, that we are worried about next, what next? We are worried about this situation has happened. What will I do? You have even lost a relative or someone who was providing for you. You have lost your fiance, you have lost your husband or your wife or your child. Such a painful situation. I want to assure us, brothers and sisters, there is peace that only God can provide that surpasses all human understanding. That is even said in 4, Philippians 4, 6, that do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in thanksgiving and prayer, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The shalom of God. And God is able even to give us that. The peace that is able to guard our hearts and our minds. The peace that brings unusual calmness even in situations that you need to be hostile. Even in the midst of trials and temptations. You know it's not easy, but that peace that comes over a terminal illness that has just been pronounced by the doctor. The peace that you know that even as I go through this, God is still on the throne and he is in control and he has not changed his love towards me. And his purpose has not changed because his purposes cannot be thwarted. You know that moment when you are living in an insecurity moment, insecure. I know as you approach the election, there is, there is a tendency to, to panic, kidogo. But the peace and the calmness that goes and say that even in this one, we know God will carry us through. 
lack, joblessness. You know the joblessness state that you know, where will I get bread for tomorrow? Matthew 6 has not changed. That says, even if I can provide you the birds of the air, that do not, or even, in other words, they don't even work. And if I can dress the lilies of the earth, how much more can I do to those who are called by my name? Bonus if you were son. Even you've gone to the doctor and you've been told you can no longer conceive. Such a painful thing. The peace that comes with that and even the assurance for the life in eternity. And I say this, this is not possible with man. But with God, it is possible. For nothing is impossible with God. Surely there is nothing. And he is not a man that he fails to do his work. He is not a son, man, a son of man that you change his mind. You know what Numbers talks about? I like this scripture, John 14, verse 27, in the NLT version. But when the Father sends the advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift. Oh, I am leaving you with a what? With a gift. And what is that gift? The peace of mind and heart. The gift that we gain from God himself. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. Oh, when you look at God, you can never get that kind of peace. So don't be troubled or afraid. Don't be troubled or afraid. You have a patient in hospital. You have a friend who just lost a job, or you just lost a job. You have been told of that terminal illness. You have been told of whatever situation. We are just opening schools. You don't even have school fees. I pray that the peace of mind and heart that only God can give as a gift will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And you know, God never promised us that we won't face tribulations, sadly, and suffering. But one thing he did, he promised us that he will be with us through it all. Buenas if you. The fact that I will face that storm and I know one thing, God is with me. The scripture that says, and I will be with you even to the end of the ages when the Lord told the disciples, when he was commissioning them. That is the kind of thing. It's the kind of peace that we're talking about this morning. And lastly, is patience as the first, as the fourth virtue, as a package of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If in Greek this, this could be brought to us what you call long and passion can be described in that way. And through the Holy Spirit, we are able, through the Holy Spirit, we are able to wait longer before indulging in our passions, in our passions towards other people, those moments that we have been stepped on. When the passions that only the Holy Spirit can give comes to us, not the passion that we are able to train ourselves, we will be long-tempered rather than being short-tempered, the patience that we are waiting willingly, continuously, that this person is going to change. You know, Ephesians 4.2 talks about be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You notice one thing, the first three, love, joy, and peace, much more are the relationship between man and God. But this one, patience, the other one is kindness, and, and the other one that follows that faithfulness is the aspect of man to man. And I know whoever is going to speak to us that will be able to mention that. And your patience is a virtue that involves bearing with one another, bearing with that personality, difference, and accepting its, their preference. You know that moment when you're having an argument with someone, and you are seeing totally that they are not reading from, you are not reading from the same page. Chances are you switch off. Isn't it? One chooses to switch off so easily. 
But when the patient that the Holy Spirit gives us is a virtue to produce, even in those moments, we will still be slow on one another. Even when we have been wronged, even when we have been mishandled, even when you go to that gate and you find a security man, he's mishandling you and you know that you're going to a high-level meeting. And then they are telling you, you can't get in here. You will still be slow with them. Patience that slowly waits for a change in behavior without getting fed up with each other. Patience that says, I know my God will be able to change this brother. I know my God will be able to change this sister. I know my God will be able to change this child. And when we remember that God himself was patient towards us, we have no reason as to why, why we are not patient to others. The kind of limitation that we might have given to God to save us, the kind of rigidity that we had when God was reaching out to us and he was patient should become a qualifier for us to be patient even on one another. You know, even Colossians 3, 13 says, time does not allow me to read that, that be patient with one another. You know, the patience that assures us of one thing, that regardless of time, regardless of chances at play, my God will still fulfill his promise towards me. That prayer that you made to God, that you are sure that God will answer you. Patience even in moments of afflictions. As according to Shulby Romans, I uh, don't know whether it's 12 or 15 that talks about that. Romans 12, 12, yes. Be patient with one another. But lastly, brothers and sisters, my parents, colleagues, and people of the same age, this is then what we need to do to bear this kind of fruits. Number one, remain in Christ. Remain in Christ. John 15, verse 4 to 5. John 15, verse 4 to 5 says, Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Buona si fiwe sana. Because unless we remain in God himself, for him to be able to prune us, to cut off some things, some things that are not so good, to chop us and to mend us, kidogo, kidogo, we will not be able to produce those kind of fruits. Because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Because typically a branch cannot produce a fruit as long as it is detached from the tree. The same case even to us. We have to remain and abide in Christ alone. But secondly, seek to glorify God in and through your life. I dare say that we don't become good so that good God may become good to us. We don't become kind. We don't become patient. We don't, we don't become loving. We don't become joyous so that we may be seen as that loving brother, that, that kind sister, that joyous sister, brother. That even um, um, that peaceful mama. No, we don't do that so that we gain glory to us. We do it so that God himself may be glorified in us. We keep singing, take your glory. Oh, that he will take his glory every day. And you know, when you read John 15 verse 8, he says, this is to my father. If you have time, by the way, you can read John 15, the whole of it, up to verse 16. If you remain in me, verse 7, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And second and thirdly, bear this kind of fruits. We need to have standing, I alluded to this earlier on, that we have been called by God. 
John 15 verse 16 says, you did not choose, him, choose me. Oh yes, we didn't choose God. He chose us. But I chose you and appointed you so you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And my emphasis is that you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. And it's not just fruit, but fruits that will last. Fruits that will go all the way to eternity. And lastly, to bear this kind of fruits, and I know we could add to this list, is live in the Spirit. You know, Galatians 5 talks about that, he says in verse 16, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Therefore, the flesh will never give you an opportunity to live by the Spirit. But when you put it to death, when you crucify it, then you are able to produce that kind of fruit. And even in verse 25, he says of chapter 5 of Galatians, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know, cultivating those spiritual disciplines on a daily basis, being in tandem and being in walk with God on a daily basis. And I don't say that for us to live by the Spirit is for us to walk around speaking in tongues or doing prophecy. But that continuously cultivation of the relationship between us and God that will eventually give us to bear fruits and fruits that will last. As I conclude, I conclude my sermon with the words of a lady called Laura Caesar, who says, Be who you want others to be. Be the forgiver. Encourager, giver, be loving, joyful, peaceful. Be patient, kind, good. Be faithful, humble, calm. Be honest, kind, truthful. Walk in love, speak graciously. Ask yourself, what if every Christian was like me? Strive for holiness, be spirit-filled and please the Lord, then all those things listed will be a result. And as we conclude, I need to remind us again, as I alluded earlier on, that it is not possible for man to produce this kind of fruit on their own. Only under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Only the Holy Spirit is able to produce this kind of fruit. This fruit, they come as a result of you choosing Christ. And once you choose Christ, you become a believer. God himself will bring the deposit of the Holy Spirit upon your life and will bring, therefore, the fruit of the Holy Spirit as a result of you experiencing and encountering God. And I say this, we don't produce this kind of fruit just for a moment. What we do for them to last even in eternity. Praise the Lord. Buona se fiusam. Let us pray. Our sovereign Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you because God, you have loved us to the point of gathering us this morning to just hear your word in the bid of preparing the body of Christ for your second return. We rejoice in the fact that, God, you have reminded us this morning of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that ought to be become the defining aspect of us as believers. We thank you because you have called us, O oh God, at such a time as this as a body of believers, O oh God, and you have called us to yourself. And you have redeemed us, O oh King of all the glory, so that we may produce this kind of fruit, fruit that will last, so that we may bring glory to your holy name. And we pray that God, through us, all oh, that you will be glorified. Through us, all oh, that you will be known. Through us, all oh, that you shall be known, O oh, King of all the glory. Through us, all oh, that people will come to experience you. And we pray this morning that God, we know that the kind of fruit that you just mentioned, by our own, we cannot produce. I pray that the deposit of the Spirit of God will be deposited upon your people this morning. That God, they will have a fresh encounter again 
with the Holy Spirit, O oh God, and that consequentially they will produce this kind of fruit, O oh God. Because we desire that we'll be well prepared before you come, O oh King of all the glory. And I pray for every one of us who is seated here. God, those who might be wondering, so then where do I begin? God, you know their hearts. You are able to start their situations. You are their destined help, O oh King of all the glory. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will walk with us and help us, O oh King of all the glory, that even as we go through our week, God, may you go with us and be with us and be our divine enabler for us to pursue righteousness and godliness in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, O oh God. So, Father, be glorified this morning. May you be exalted. May you be seen in this podium. May you be seen in the life of your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, trusting and believing. Amen, and thank you so much. May the Lord bless you.